Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, this is Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Dr. Sharfstein talks to Dr. Raina Plowright, an assistant professor at Montana State University. Dr. Plowright studies spillover, how pathogens move from animals to humans. Can spillover be prevented? Let's listen. Dr. Plowright, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. I want to ask you about the spillover of COVID-19. In my mind, spillover is a pretty simple concept. The virus was in bats, somehow it made it into humans. But you focus on that somehow. Can you talk about how you think about spillover? Spillover superficially does seem very simple, right? It's just a virus or some sort of pathogen jumps from one species to another. But it's actually very complicated. And it's quite difficult for us to, to become infected from an, uh, a, a pathogen from another species. Otherwise, we'd probably be sick quite often. Because if you think of it, every time you walk outside, you are bombarded with microbes from other species, yet you actually rarely get sick. So what has to happen for this spillover to be successful? So there's a series of events. We think of them as this hierarchical series of potential barriers. So first, we have to have a reservoir host, and that reservoir host has to be infected so that populations have to be maintaining the pathogen. They have to have enough pathogen that when they excrete this, uh, we'll call it a virus, in feces or urine, there's enough virus available for the next host to get an infectious dose. And then the next host has to be susceptible to the pathogen. So the pathogen is going to get into the host through the respiratory tract or the skin or maybe through eating orally. The pathogen has to be able to get in, if it's a virus, into the cells. It's going to be able to replicate itself. It's going to be able to exit those cells. It's then going to be able to disseminate through that new host and then transmit from host to host. And often all of those factors don't come together. Yeah, I mean, from the virus's perspective, the pathogen's perspective, everything has to go right. From our perspective, everything has to go wrong. Right. That's exactly right. And that's probably why these are relatively rare events. So why is it important to understand them in in that level of detail? Well, if we could have stopped that original spillover event, then we could have actually stopped the entire pandemic. And it's often, often once, once an epidemic has started, we're so caught up in the public health emergency, as we should be, that we forget to go back and see how it started in the first place. And a classic example is Ebola 2014, where we understand that the whole epidemic occurred from probably a single transmission event from a bat to a small boy in Guinea. And then there were 11,000 deaths, 28,000 cases, yet very little attention was paid on to understanding that spillover event. It was an afterthought. And if we can't get the data and understand those conditions, then it will be harder and harder for us to prevent those conditions from aligning in the future. So are you saying that we may sort of take as a given that there might be spillover events rather than ask, how can we prevent them in the first place? Well, we shouldn't take it as a given because we do know there are factors that make them more likely. So as I went through all of the factors that have to come together, infected reservoir hosts have to have some sort of contact with humans. They have to be infected. They have to be shedding the pathogen. Factors like uh, stressful conditions for the reservoir hosts, lack of food, fragmentation of their habitats can all increase the amount of pathogen in their populations, the likelihood that they'll be shedding pathogen at any particular time. And then processes like like building roads, like wildlife trade, bring people into contact with the pathogen and make spillover more likely. Is there evidence that we can do things to prevent spillovers from happening? We're building that evidence base right now with other pathogens like Hendra and Nipah virus, 
Hendra virus in Australia, it's a bat-borne pathogen that spills over from bats to horses to humans. We're understanding that we're more likely to see spillover events when the bats don't have enough food to eat in winter. But when we do see trees blossoming and nectar production and food available, we see no spillover events. So that's suggesting that if we preserve habitat and restore their natural habitat, that we might be able to stop spillover events. And then it, for Nipah virus in Bangladesh, by understanding how spillover happens and understanding that it's the date palm sap consumption that leads to spillover, we could stop bats having access to the date palm sap. So the key point there is if we understand the mechanisms by which spillover happens and the confluence of events that leads to spillover, we may be able to do things to stop it from happening in the first place. What's the state of research into preventing spillovers? Is this a crowded field, well-funded, or is this something that has generally been overlooked? It's generally overlooked, and it's hard to know why that is. There is so much attention on the virus, and as there should be. Uh, I think it's it's very difficult field. You have you have to go into the field. You've, you've got to get your your boots dirty. It's hard work. You have to be able to study the the reservoir host. You need a very transdisciplinary approach. You need to understand the the ecology of the host, how they move, how they persist with the viruses. What are the human behaviors that bring bring people in contact? It takes long-term, expensive, difficult studies that require many, many different perspectives. So yes, it's expensive, it's difficult, there are not many groups doing it. Is it dangerous? I mean, some people might hear this and wonder, if we send people into remote areas to encounter hosts of potentially lethal pathogens, they could come home with a potentially lethal pathogen on board. Right. Well, safety is our first priority with all of our field activities. So we wear full PPE. We have N95 respirators. We have Tyvek suits, goggles, as if we were working with the pathogens in the lab. And we have very strict protocols that have been approved by biosafety committees to ensure that we're not at risk. We generally, we put out our samples and most bat pathogen researchers will do this. We put our samples right into a buffer that inactivates them immediately, and then we spray those sample cases down with a a solution that inactivates any virus. And then those samples go into minus 80, into a, um, a liquid nitrogen in the field. So we're very cautious. We handle bats with multiple pairs of gloves that are puncture resistant. Uh, We use welders gloves when we're actually restraining the bats in the net. Our greatest danger, I think, would be more within the, the... the things that you encounter in the field. And so I've worked in places where having crocodiles track our movements with the nets has been really a major concern where we've had to move our nets every morning so that the crocodiles don't learn our patterns of of behavior or working on boats to try to catch bats and so on. Being in the field always has its inherent dangers, but we minimize the biosafety risks with very strict protocols. Are we at risk for more spillover events because of climate change? I think we are. If you think about the way that animals adapt to climate is they often will, they'll move, they'll adapt by changing their latitudinal distribution. And this means that we've got different species mixing in different ways. So that's going to change the way that pathogens are distributed across the landscape. It's going to change our contact patterns with the animals that host these pathogens. Uh, animals that can't move will try to adapt or will not be able to adapt. Um, And so animals are under much more stress. They're looking for different food sources. They're much more likely to have novel behaviors that will will bring us into contact or make them more likely to be infected. So I'd say we really should be cautious. We should be at least studying how climate change is going to change the probability of spillover in these systems. Yeah, I mean, if there is that pressure, then having some better sense of how to mitigate the potential impact on zoonotic diseases would be helpful. Yes, yes. So if we can understand how it's happening, then we can address the specific mechanisms. But even if we don't understand how this is happening in every system, there are these really broad generalizations. Like we know anything that brings us into contact with animals, anything that moves animals out of their habitat is going to make spillover more likely. So large intact habitats where animals are allowed to do their thing and where they're allowed to access the resources they need to be healthy 
those sort of major conservation efforts are going to reduce pathogen spillover. Got it. So you have really helped me expand my concept of prevention because prevention is can actually stretch before the spillover. This is like pre-spillover prevention in order to protect against more pandemics. That's our goal. Our goal is to think about pandemic prevention at that pre-pandemic stage. How could we stop the spillover event from ever happening? And there are some very broad principles that we could follow to stop the spillover in terms of looking after animal communities so that they're not under the pressures that lead to high pathogen, high pathogen burdens, high pathogen shedding, and that we don't have the, the human behaviours that bring us into contact with animals where spillover might be likely to occur. Well, Dr. Plare, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. It's been really fun to talk to you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. <laughs>